I'm Lynn Packer with my 30-second report on Operation Underground Railroad and Tim Ballard. This episode, Tim and Russell Ballard lying about their financial dealings. Up until the LDS Church's bombshell press statement denouncing Tim Ballard's conduct as morally unacceptable, Tim Ballard and M. Russell Ballard, the senior apostle in the Mormon Church, neither confirmed nor denied they had joint business dealings. The LDS statement said, President Ballard never authorized his name or the name of the church to be used for Tim's personal or financial interests. The statement inferred the two did not engage in business, but there was no direct, clear denial. That quickly changed. Both issued explicit denials. First, Tim Ballard. He said, never in my life, never have I used his name to raise money. And I've never had any business dealings with him. It's not true. Nothing's, nothing in here is true. I have never used Elder Brother's name, ever. I've never traded on his name to ask for anything. I've never had any business dealings with him. The LDS Church provided a September 26 statement to the Salt Lake Tribune, which wrote, Church spokesman Doug Anderson told the Tribune on Monday that the Apostle is not a key equity holder or a silent partner and has no relationship with Slave Stealers. Slave Stealers LLC is believed to be one of the ventures the two shared a common financial interest in. I asked the Tribune reporter how he interpreted the church statement, and he said, My understanding is that he said there was no involvement in any way in any of Tim's ventures. The Mormon Church's spin portrays Russell Ballard as having been victimized by Tim Ballard. It concedes no wrongdoing on Russell Ballard's part. It does not explain how a prophet, seer, and revelator could so easily be deceived by a con man. Tim Ballard's denial is being fact-checked by news outlets. Russell Ballard's denial is not. Until now, Russell Ballard has been given a free pass. The evidence is overwhelming the Ballards were engaged in business ventures together. They're both lying about their financial connections. And as lies go, theirs are whoppers in the face of considerable contradictory evidence. While it's said that honesty may be the best policy, sometimes admissions can lead to even darker truths. Let's go back to the LDS Church's Tim Ballard denunciation to consider one possible darker truth. You'll recall it said, President Ballard never authorized his name or the name of the church to be used for Tim's personal or financial interests. More about financial interests coming up. But now we're learning that personal interests may include Tim Ballard's alleged personal interest in extracurricular sexual liaisons. Attorney Suzette Rasmussen, in a press conference near the steps of Utah's Capitol, summarized the accusations by quoting her clients. While engaging in that noble cause, we were subjected to sexual harassment, spiritual manipulation, grooming, and sexual misconduct. In its story about the press conference, Vice News added, Ballard is alleged to have invoked his own personal connection to the divine, and the authority of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to persuade women who worked for and with OUR that testing their sexual chemistry with them was, in essence, approved by God. Does that mean approved by Russell Ballard? That's what some female victims have been saying. Consider what LDS podcaster Jimmy Rex said about that. Rex was a big Tim Ballard fan and had been deployed as an OUR operative and has interviewed several other OUR operatives on his show, including Sean Reyes, Paul Hutchinson, and Ballard himself. But on September 22nd, there was no interview, no guest, just an outpouring of disgust. Rex said he had spoken with more than one still anonymous alleged Tim Ballard mistresses who said Tim Ballard told them Russell Ballard condoned the alleged affairs.
Um, long story short, at that meeting, Tim had mentioned that his silent partner was M. Russell Ballard. The church is smart enough to know this. They don't want... Uh, once they found out that Tim was having affairs and he was using M. Russell Ballard's name, saying that he basically okayed it um, to fool these women um, that were volunteering for OUR. Um, and that's why he was essentially betrayed so badly. That's why the church publicly made sure that everybody knew that the church didn't endorse Tim or OUR because it's that bad. You know, it's not the church's fault. I was duped by Tim too. Um, Another source told me how women were groomed and spiritually manipulated. He said when Ballard got to the point he needed to convince an OUR volunteer, fake wife, to have sex, his ace card was telling her it was blessed by an LDS apostle, M. Russell Ballard. In December 2020, almost three years ago, I reported in depth on Russell Ballard's and Tim Ballard's joint involvement in one of Tim Ballard's business undertakings. I followed up with additional detail and other reports. These reports gave Russell Ballard and other top church leaders almost three years to deny the two were financially connected. The facts in those stories remain uncontested. This is one of the slides from that December 2020 report that explains what it was about. LDS Apostle M. Russell Ballard's spiritual and financial connections to Tim Ballard and Operation Underground Railroad. Before publishing, I gave Russell Ballard and a church spokesman ample opportunity to respond. I emailed the same spokesman who released the church's Tim Ballard denunciation statement this year. I wrote, my next report will deal with the so-called Russell Ballard connection. You're aware that Tim Ballard and President Russell Ballard share an interest in American history as it pertains to the covenant. Tim Ballard accompanied President Ballard on a 2019 tour of historical sites, along with President Ballard's son Craig and son-in-law Brad Brower. I'd like a brief phone interview with President Ballard in connection with an apparent investment or donation he made to the nonprofit Operation Underground Railroad or one of its affiliated entities. Two sources told me another general authority may have done likewise. Another source said President Ballard was the inspiration for Tim Ballard leaving his job at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and forming OUR in 2013. Two weeks later, Doug Anderson responded. Hi, Lynn. Thank you for your inquiry and desire to interview President Ballard for your ongoing coverage. After consideration, we will not be able to provide an interview at this time. Thank you, Doug. I sent a reply email. Thanks for getting back. I plan to post the report related to President Ballard by Monday. I pasted an image of the title slide below. If, after viewing it, President Ballard decides to answer questions or comment, please let me know. By the way, the other general authority, there may be more than one, who was said to have invested in an OUR-related entity is Robert Gay, whose business partner, Steve Young, is a well-known OUR supporter. I made a direct request to Elder Gay's office for confirmation and or comment, and he also declined to return my call. Neither Russell Ballard nor Anderson got back. Next, I'm going to summarize previous reports, leaving out quite a bit of detail, beginning with how and when the two Ballards who are not related first met. And yes, it had to do with a Tim Ballard financial undertaking. It was after Tim, while still an agent with Homeland Security, wrote a book titled The Covenant. First, Glenn Beck took an interest in the book, and promoted it and had Ballard on his show. And then Russell Ballard took an interest. Beck plugged Ballard's book and agreed with its premise that an angel guided Christopher Columbus to America where America's founders made a covenant with God. The book became Tim and Russell Ballard's first business connection. A source familiar with that connection said, Tim's first book, released October 2011, was read by Elder Ballard. After reading the book, Elder Ballard asked for Tim to meet with him. He did so for a three-hour visit. 
Elder Ballard said every American needs to read this great book and counseled Tim to write another copy without the LDS doctrine in it for the mainstream. And through that endeavor, it will become a missionary tool. The book is an example of Mormon disinformation, history rewritten to fit a Mormon narrative. One historian said, Tim Ballard wrote more fiction than fact, and his books reflect broader trends of the far right, which is increasingly untethered from reality. One example of Ballard's historical fiction, in his book, The Pilgrim Hypothesis, he tells the story of Mayflower passenger John Howland, who fell overboard, and Ballard says was miraculously rescued, which Ballard claims led to the fulfillment of prophecy, that is leading to the founding of the Mormon Church by Howland's descendants. Tim Ballard also says Russell Ballard is one of Howland's descendants, implying that a miracle led to Russell Ballard's birth. What could have more impact, that is, make more money and bring more people to Mormonism than books? A television series subsidized by taxpayers, a series that would make Tim Ballard and his investors wealthy while spreading the gospel. A television series about Tim Ballard leading dramatic, dangerous rescue missions, saving child sex slaves. Russell Ballard counseled Tim Ballard to leave government service, found a nonprofit, Operation Underground Railroad, while at the same time he created a for-profit business to produce a television series that Russell Ballard and others could invest in. In an article I published in 2017, I created a flowchart to show how the nonprofit OUR worked with the for profit venture, the Abolitionists LLC. Tim Ballard would control both organizations. OUR would provide what would be referred to as the sizzle video of operatives helping rescue child sex slaves, while the profit venture provides video that could be used as evidence but mainly for the TV series. Initially, Ballard would be paid by both entities. Russell Ballard invested on the for-profit side. Besides Russell Ballard, two other high church officials are believed to have invested with Tim Ballard's for-profit venture. Robert Gay, who has since become an emeritus general authority, and Dale Renlund, an apostle. The three purportedly invested about $600,000 in 2013 in Ballard's movie-making venture. All declined comment, would neither confirm nor deny. After that, Tim Ballard was able to pick up the phone and arrange for one of his Haiti operatives to meet Elder Renlund for a photo op. After OUR's first missions, a pilot for the proposed television series was produced. The film production company produced a seven-episode pilot to pitch television networks and cable channels. The last episode was about the failed search for Gardy Marty, led by a psychic, although in the series she is referred to as an informant who came forward with intelligence. But no one wanted the series, so that idea was replaced with another. So the producers took the series footage and made a movie out of it, a sort of docudrama for theatrical distribution narrated by Tim Ballard. It premiered in Utah and California with big fanfare, endorsed by Utah's governor, attorney general, and other politicians. But it bombed at the box office, which led to the next movie project, Sound of Freedom, this time with actors and a completely fictitious plot about Ballard rescuing kidnapped child sex slaves. Leading up to producing Sound of Freedom, Tim Ballard incorporated a company called Liberty 89. It might have been the vehicle contemplated to own the movie rights. Among Liberty 89's directors was Brad Brower, Russell Ballard's son-in-law. It appears Brower represented his father-in-law's interests, keeping Russell Ballard in the shadows. But less than six months later, on January 11, 2017, Tim Ballard canceled Liberty 89. The very next day, on January 12, 2017, 
There was a secret meeting at LDS Church headquarters. Tim Ballard, along with Eduardo Verastegui, who agreed to produce The Sound of Freedom, Patrick Slim, a Mexican billionaire who agreed to help fund it, and movie co-producer Sean Reyes met with the entire Quorum of Twelve Apostles, would have included two who may have originally invested in Tim Ballard's movie making. Tim Ballard reportedly sat next to Russell Ballard, and among other topics, discussed how the sound of freedom might help bring moviegoers to the covenant, that is, join the Mormon church. Before publishing the video you're now watching, I ask a church spokesman for comment on the secret meeting. He declined. How did information about the secret meeting leak? It came from Toxic Munoz, former deputy chief of staff for Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes, also friends with Paul Hutchinson, and an operative for at least one of OUR's strikes in Mexico City. Because of his close association with Reyes, he came to know where a lot of bodies are buried. Before we go on, I need to sort out some dates on the timeline. Remember the church's denial the Tribune published late last month? It said church spokesperson Doug Anderson told the Tribune on Monday that the apostle is not a key equity holder or silent partner, and has no relationship with slave stealers. Here's how Tim Ballard's company, Slave Stealers, fits into the timeline. In 2013, Russell Ballard invested in a proposed TV series. In 2016, The Abolitionists, a documentary, using TV series footage, premiered, then bombed. In 2017, there was that secret meeting at church headquarters. There was not yet a Slave Stealers at that time. In 2018, Slave Stealers, LLC, was incorporated. Then in August of 2019, there was the whiteboard meeting. That was all about Slave Stealers. Slave Stealers would be more than a book, as this Deseret News article pointed out. The headline, Tim Ballard's new book, Slave Stealers, ESPN feature, are part of a larger plan to tell OUR's story and rescue children. It said Ballard's drive to promote slave stealers is just one part of a massive effort to spread the word and generate support for OUR's mission to save six million children around the globe from trafficking. Operation Underground Railroad is also sharing its story through film. It was recently featured in a documentary called Operation Toussaint. And a full-length feature, The Sound of Freedom, starring actors Jim Caviezel and Myra Servino, is expected to be released in the summer of 2019. Tim Ballard was moving so fast with his massive effort, he had yet to even incorporate slave stealers, which he did. Ballard filed an expedited request for incorporation. Where was slave stealers headquartered? at 228 South, 200 West, in Farmington, Utah. Slave Stealers LLC was located at the existing office of Brad Brower, Russell Ballard's son-in-law. As a Slave Stealers silent partner, Ballard ostensibly had Brower handle much of the business. That brings us to the infamous whiteboard meeting in August 2019 where Tim Ballard allies were told about Russell Ballard's business dealings with Tim Ballard. It's a story I broke more than two years ago. That meeting was held at the home of multimillionaire Paul Hutchinson. On many OUR sting operations, Hutchinson played the role of an American sex tourist pedophile. He's portrayed in The Sound of Freedom by Eduardo Verastegui. The site of the whiteboard meeting is where Hutchinson held a lot of parties for the rich and famous. That included millionaires, celebrities, and Utah jazz stars, many driving exotic sports cars, a house rumored to have a so-called sex room, where some partiers could go for a little privacy. This is a cell phone photo of the diagram Tim Ballard drew on the whiteboard at the meeting as he explained his big plan massive effort, as the Deseret News described it, to monetize various for-profit and non-profit entities. Movers and shakers were there, including millionaire real estate agent and podcaster Jimmy Rex.
Um, Tim did have a very close relationship with Ed Russell Ballard. Very obvious. They have pictures of them traveling and doing other things. Um, he also was a silent partner, according to Tim, in this whole thing that he was trying to do. The whiteboard video and all that stuff. I recreated the chart to make it easier to follow the money flow. It was at this meeting several attendees learned that Russell Ballard was a silent partner in Slave Stealers LLC, an entity at the top of the chart, the company created to manage the entire enterprise. The now terminated criminal investigation had been paying particular attention to slave stealers, as reflected in some of the interviews conducted by the FBI and Davis County attorney investigators. In September, Vice News obtained and reported on transcripts of some key FBI Davis County witness interviews, some of which touched on the whiteboard meeting and slave stealers. Vice reported, The ties between Tim Ballard and Elder Ballard described in the documents are numerous and occasionally bizarre. Testimony indicated Russell Ballard was a partner in a for-profit business called Slave Stealers, which was pitched as a way to control OUR and other nonprofits. It's more proof that Tim Ballard and Russell Ballard are lying when they deny they had a financial relationship. On the next few slides are excerpts from some of the witness statements and records that were part of the criminal investigation. This statement was transcribed from a video of Tim Ballard speaking to a group of OUR employees. The highlighting was done by the investigators. Through the whole process and all of these miracles, I've reported back to Elder Ballard at least every month, sometimes more. And on the way to the airport last night, I stopped by his house, and Catherine and I spent about an hour with him, and he gave me a very powerful blessing. He had also given Gesno a blessing, referring to Gesno Marty, whose son Gardy had disappeared. He blessed us with total success. He blessed us that the Spirit would lead us. He blessed us that we would know what to do and not to do in every step. It would open up clearly to us. So much for Tim Ballard's denial, he did not name drop. One witness told investigators that Russell Ballard was in the loop during the failed Guardi rescue mission. According to one of the witnesses, he stated that one of the phone calls was to Elder Ballard to plan the press release of rescuing Guardy, contrary to any actual information that they had nothing to verify that Guardy was anywhere near the hilltop camp other than the psychic readings from Janet. Janet, of course, referring to spiritual channeler Janet Russon, who would point out on a map where Guardy was supposedly being held as a labor and sex slave. She was on the botched rescue mission. Next, testimony from one of OUR's main operatives, Dave Lopez, seen here with Tim Ballard being interviewed by Glenn Beck. One investigator asked him, deception or ego for Tim? Dave stated both. Dave said he thinks Tim is fully convinced that he is supposed to be the Mormon Messiah and lead people back to the church. Dave said he really believes that and that the Mormon church is behind it. Dave said there is obviously a lot of financial gain. Dave said one of the final straws for him was that Tim had set up another for-profit company called Slave Stealers. Elder Ballard, M. Russell Ballard, was the silent partner with Slave Stealers, and his son-in-law, Brad Brower, would be on the business. Lopez told investigators about the sizzle, a movie, and Russell Brunson. Dave said Tim has told him personally that the Mormon church is really behind this and that it's a secret way of converting people by using the sizzle of the rescue to attract people to the Mormon covenant. Dave stated that Russell Brunson directed the movie Toussaint and Russell Brunson was basically recommended by the church and Elder Ballard. Lopez's mention of the sizzle refers to the whiteboard. Russell Brunson actually did not direct Ballard's movie, Operation Toussaint, but he did pay for much of it. I reported on Brunson two years ago. Russell Brunson is an Eagle, Idaho Mormon 
A multi-millionaire marketing genius whose ClickFunnels software helps small businesses market their products online. Brunson hosted a 2018 private showing of the movie Operation Toussaint, where he and the movie's director, Nick Natton, were on stage with Tim Ballard. The fundraiser brought in $1 million. After the Mormon church denounced Tim Ballard, Brunson wasted no time defending him against what Brunson claimed were false allegations. Brunson said he knew because he had sat in the same room with Tim Ballard and Russell Ballard to discuss matters. Hey, my name is Russell Brunson, for those who don't know me. And I make this video to talk about Tim Ballard. Um, a lot of you guys know that he's someone who we have been supporting for the last few years. So the most recent article that came out uh, was basically saying that the Mormon church was against Tim Ballard and this whole huge thing and it's this big, this big scandal. Um, uh, and it's interesting because um, the way that I found out about Tim Ballard and about Operation Underground Road was actually from Elder Ballard. He personally called me and asked me to help Tim Ballard in Operation Underground Road. I have literally sat in the rooms with Elder Ballard and Tim Ballard as we discussed these things and these ideas. Um, the accusations that they're being made um, on the media are not true. Uh, as someone who was literally in the room when these conversations were happening, um, just be fully aware he's being attacked from the outside. This is not the truth, okay? It is not the truth. Again, and this is coming from someone who literally, I've been in the rooms with him and Elder Ballard talking about these things, okay? I've been in the rooms. Elder Ballard's one who introduced me. Tim never came to me and like, told me some big story about Elder Ballard and I tried to get me in. It was the opposite way around. Okay, so fully you need to understand like, this is the way it's actually working. This is the actual truth. Not some rogue employee who got fired because they were bad at their job. With friends like Brunson, Tim and Russell Ballard don't need enemies. Brunson's statement is the strongest proof that Russell Ballard was deeply involved with Tim Ballard's business ventures. In this case, Russell Ballard helping seek millionaire funding for the for-profit movie Operation Toussaint. I interviewed Dave Lopez more than two years after he spoke with criminal investigators. He added a bit more detail. He said, speaking of Russell Ballard's son-in-law and slave stealers, Brad Brower was doing most of the day-to-day -day business stuff, but Lopez never met him in person. There was discussion about building a multi-billion dollar entity during what he called a bizarre, shady time. Tim Ballard was supposed to get a million dollars a year. He said he would get emailed photos of Tim Ballard hanging out with Elder Ballard. And he said he met Apostle Dale Renland once in Haiti. They seemed to know each other very well, he said. Former OUR employee Sheriston Stockwell was another witness for the FBI Davis County investigation. Special Agent Kevin Luke asked if Sheriston was ever asked to go and meet with any high-ranking LDS church members. Sheriston said she did. Sheriston said she met with M. Russell Ballard privately with Tim Ballard with another general authority, Elder Ronald Rasban, who was over the Haiti area. Sheriston stated she met with Elder Russell Ballard and Tim Ballard privately at an OUR function. Sheriston said she did meet with Elder Rasban in the church office building in a conference room with Tim Ballard, herself, Jerry Gowan, and Jessica Mass. Sheriston said she was in a few private meetings with Elder Russell Ballard, not as a private church meeting, but he would come to an OUR event and they would meet in a VIP meeting. However, Tim met with Elder Ballard once a month. Tim Ballard's wife, Catherine, during a radio interview after her husband had been accused of sexual misconduct, described the Tim Ballard, Russell Ballard meetings from her perspective. Elder Ballard has been so wonderful, so supportive, acting as a, as unofficial counsel. He would get, if Tim didn't, didn't schedule an appointment every month, he would, he would call him and say, why haven't you come in? And we just treasured that relationship. It was such a gift, mm -hmm. especially when really hard decisions were being made, like, do we start this nonprofit? Tim and Elder Ballard are very close. They, uh, every time we meet with him, Elder Ballard expresses his love for Tim. I got a sense that there was concern that Tim was inappropriately using Elder Ballard's name and to promote Operation Underground Railroad or his business dealings. 
Never. Elder Ballard was very careful about that relationship because he he always told Tim, I don't want I I don't want to hurt your organization by bringing the church into it. And I don't want the organization to hurt the church. Vice versa by by being too open about this, but but so they were both very careful. But of course, the the LDS world is small yeah. within Utah. Yeah. So people hear they hear that Tim mm-hmm. meets with him. Mm-hmm. Stockwell says Russell Ballard may have known about the psychic. Sheriston said Tim was the only person who vouched for Janet's role as a psychic. Sheriston said she had not heard that Janet was ever vetted or vouched for by the LDS Church, but stated Tim blurred lines and would frequently say, I told Elder Ballard all about it. Sheriston said there was one time when doTERRA, that's an MLM marketing company, found out about the use of a psychic and were upset about it. She said that Tim brought in an official CIA case, meaning he brought it up, where they brought in a psychic, and it worked. Tim told him the federal government uses psychics regularly. Shearston said Tim took her to a meeting in her official OUR work capacity to meet with people at Thanksgiving Point. The people at the meeting included Tom Harrison, Ken Krogh, Hugh Vale, and Tim Ballard. Shearston said they claimed to have visions and special intelligence of the second coming. Sheriston said Tim would say that M. Russell Ballard is part of Liberty 89. Sheriston said that because she had shared some spiritual things and Tim found out about it, he, Tim, could share with her the more secret things that I'm, Tim, involved in. Sheriston said during this meeting they spoke about Liberty 89, America being a fallen nation, and how it was Tim's calling to do these things with OUR and restoring America to the covenant. Sheriston said restoring America to the covenant was a big mission of his, that's Tim's, and he was called of God to do this. Sheriston said Tim was very verbal about Elder Russell Ballard's involvement and behind it, but Sheriston said she didn't know if she believed that. That concludes experts from the criminal investigation interviews. Next, Russell Ballard's past business dealings before he met Tim Ballard. It was predictable that Russell Ballard, given his history of dubious business dealings, would engage with Tim Ballard's fishy financial ventures. This next final section condenses information from my previous reports about Russell Ballard's history of business failures and suspected fraud. Russell Ballard, at age 23, began selling cars at his father's Nash dealership. A Mormon church biographical sketch says Ballard was the top-selling salesman for his father's car dealership when he left it in the early 1950s to pursue other business interests. Russell Ballard's biographies only disclose an involvement with investment businesses between selling cars at his father's dealership and then returning to take it over. In 1956, he returned and took over the Ballard Motor Company from his father. Here's what the LDS Church and Ballard leave out of his resume. Ballard, in 1954, at age 26, became heavily engaged in Utah's ultra-volatile, fraud-ridden penny stock market. He continued even after taking over his father's dealership. In 1954, Ballard helped found the Tatro Uranium Mining Company. Tatro had merged with Bojo Uranium. It traded around 10 cents a share. Utah's penny stock market, especially the trading of uranium mine shares, is the genesis of Utah earning the title Stock Fraud Capital of the United States. And Russell Ballard was in the middle of it. Ballard, at 28, took over the car dealership while still engaged in the penny stock market. In the meantime, he began his ascent to power in the LDS Church, serving as counselor to bishops and then bishop. 
At his dealership, Ballard dropped Nash and picked up Edsel. He says he prayed about the decision. When Ford showed him the car for the first time, Russell received the impression, do not sign the franchise. In just a year, Ford Motor and this dealers lost hundreds of millions of dollars. Ballard says the result of not following the prompting of the spirit, I took our company very close to the brink of bankruptcy. While his Edsel dealership floundered, Ballard opened a penny stock brokerage firm, Keystone Securities Corp. The Securities and Exchange Commission accused Ballard of fraud and revoked his broker-dealer license. The Wall Street Journal reported that Ballard was accused of stock price manipulation. The SEC action was highly publicized. It triggered a lawsuit in federal court and even a hearing in Congress. Yet Ballard remained in good standing with the church. Even as news about the SEC's fraud finding lingered about penny stock fraud accusations against Russell Ballard, he launched a new public offering. In 1964, he began raising money from investors to build the Valley Music Hall in North Salt Lake. Ballard was selling 600,000 shares for $1.25 each. Despite the backing of Mormon church leaders and celebrities, the Valley Music Hall was a financial disaster. Ballard tried various schemes to rescue Valley Music Hall investors. He formed the Door to Door Sales Company, Family Achievement Institute, to acquire Valley Music Hall. FAI marketed vinyl recordings of Mormon themed self help messages by Art Linkletter, Pat Boone, and others. They also sold illustrated Bibles and Books of Mormon. The FTC sanctioned one of the companies involved in the attempt to bail out Valley Music Hall. The FTC claimed IMC made false, misleading, and deceptive statements, misled members with regard to purchasing substantial quantities of product. Here's how Ballard's LDS biography portrays his Valley Music Hall stock offering. One highlight of his business career was his presidency of the Valley Music Hall in Bountiful, Utah, which offered high-quality family entertainment. There, Ballard worked with Art Linkletter, Danny Thomas, Bob Cummings, and other Hollywood celebrities who were advisors to the enterprise. Although the Music Hall failed financially, he ensured that investors recovered the money invested. But Ballard did not ensure. The LDS Church stepped in and ensured. LDS spin doctors turned a low light into a highlight. The LDS Church bought the Valley Music Hall in November of 1970. Church members and seven LDS stakes helped pay for what was and continues to be a white elephant of a meeting place. Ballard invested in penny stock schemes after going to work for the church full-time. For example, Biomeridian, a penny stock company that marketed a quack medical appliance. Russell Ballard's involvement with Tim Ballard's questionable financial ventures follows a list of his association with business failures and frauds. So his lying about a business tie with Tim Ballard, that is denying it, is no surprise given that past conduct. It's also no surprise that an LDS church spokesman attempts to paint Russell Ballard as a Tim Ballard victim rather than as a Tim Ballard accomplice. That's the end. Thanks for watching. For questions, comments, and suggested corrections, my email address is lpacker636 at gmail.com.